Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm here to talk about best practices around securing your in-house third-party binary execution environments. My name is Mukul Kuller. I've been in the industry, as uh, Vandana explained. Uh, don't need the mic. Uh, been in the industry for over, a little over nine years. I, uh, I'm coming from a prior offensive consulting experience. Uh, and my uh, role has over time evolved doing product application security at LinkedIn, where I get to help secure complex integrations, uh, making sure our applications are designed with security and privacy in mind, and performing risk assessments and manual pen penetration testing uh, to ensure that we identify any critical design flaws find any uh, major vulnerabilities and fix them before the bad guys do. Um, I'm deeply passionate about uh, web application security, cloud security, and the evolving landscape of containers. Uh, and I've previously spoken at AppSec. Uh, I, I actually gave lightning training talks at AppSec EU and AppSec California, uh, along with other colleagues. So. That's my introduction, and opinions are, of course, mine, not my employers. So who is this talk for? Well, if you are an engineer or a system architect working on any initiatives or features in your organization that depend on the execution of third-party native binary execution in your environments, then this talk is for you. If, uh, alternatively, if you're a security professional like me who has uh, who often gets the challenge of securing newer integrations where developers come up to you and ask, hey, can we, can we do this? And uh, from a security standpoint, you've got to do the risk assessment uh, and help improve the state of uh, security, overall security. So then this talk is for you as well, if you're not already applying those best practices. This talk is not about any negative perceptions. I don't mean to. Uh, imply any, any negativity towards any tools or uh, tech, uh, any specific technologies that will be mentioned. Uh, this is not a new zero day, I wish. Uh, this is not about a specific kernel uh, or hypervisor or container attack landscape. Uh, I'm not advocating the use of any sp uh, specific vendors or tools that I may have also used in my demonstration purposes. And this is not, unfortunately, a one-size-fits-for-all solution, right? You Everybody's environment is custom, pretty complex. There might be different reasons why some things work for some organizations and some things don't. Uh, that includes performance, scalability, etc. cetera. Um, so it, to each its own. I am going to talk about what can go wrong if you directly uh, dealt with untrusted executables and, and hosted them on pro in your prod environment. And uh, my intent is, for you, my intent of this talk is for you to walk out uh, with a good understanding of the layers and of best practices that you can apply uh, towards uh, a defense in depth inspired architecture that you can leverage to secure your environments in practice. All right, so let's get started. To put it simply, native executables are usually extremely powerful. Have wide open access to numerous system calls uh, that exposes those native, uh, that, ex that exposes the white kernel surface to that process. Um, and typically these tools are written in low level languages such as C uh, that are not fully type safe, may allow for unchecked uh, random arithmetic operations via pointers that would allow the program to reach arbitrary, arbitrary areas of the memory. Um, and are usually programs might be vulnerable to typical uh, format string bugs. And it's very hard to get it right. Unless you are a seasoned security-minded developer, it is very easy to write insecure code in C. Apart from the language itself, many native binaries and third-party executables are simple wrappers around existing other libraries and uh, command line executables that, are, that may already be present on your systems. And these tools, especially the ones that are decades old, maybe written in the 90s, may not have been designed with any sort of maliciousness in mind. They haven't been threat modeled. They are often, um, uh, I'm sorry. 
Oops. Lost my pointer. Um, they, they haven't been threat modeled. They haven't been probably been fuzzed. And to be honest, they don't really get all the security attention that's required until some tragedy strikes, until there's a, there's a bug that got famous or infamous uh, for, for, for the wrong reasons. And suddenly, uh, you know, there's, until there's a cool, new, shiny bug and uh, you know, a, a website dedicated with a cool logo and a cool name, you know, uh, programs might not be introspected that much by the security community either. And execution, so un execution of untrusted executables is bad. You don't control that code. You're running it in your pr production environment. It's bad enough, but a tad bit safer if you were passing only <coughs> trusted executables uh, or trusted uh, inputs to those binaries. Uh, and those by trusted inputs, I mean something that you s yourself solely generated and you're 100% sure wherever this image is coming from uh, is, is, does not contain any, any sort of maliciousness. However, allowing such code to be run in the context of um, running a publicly f uh, running such code that executes untrusted inputs from your users and you're running it on a publicly facing web application, uh, you know, you will, you will leave your, uh, forget your good night's sleep. Uh, a simple command injection flaw in any such untrusted code could be exploited to run arbitrary code on your servers. And from there on, exploitation would completely depend on uh, which conditions that the, that execution was taking place in and what is achievable from there on. So as a security practitioner, you may be signed up for a huge number of mailing lists. Uh, ded dedicated security mailing lists exist, OSS security mailing lists, where oftentimes you will get to know of uh, the most critical bugs that you care about. And you decide, you get, get an alert on your email, and you decide whether you want to patch or not. Or, well, hopefully you're patching every time you're receiving those alerts. But it's, it's a really hard thing to keep up, uh, especially when you're running a wide variety of tools especially native tools in your, uh, in your environment, right? Um, for instance, this is a tool, FFmpeg, very, very, uh, very popular tool. And I was looking the other day for a dedicated mailing list that I could join and I could receive alerts on every time there was new CVs that were fixed in the next bug release. And I couldn't find one. There's none of those mailing lists is dedicated security mailing list. And that makes it really hard to keep up unless you are uh, integrating with some vendor who's telling you about these bugs that exist uh, or some new zero day or new patches that have been applied to a binary. And in many cases, uh, security updates might be too, uh, too often right, for you to really uh, keep up with them. And sometimes in, in uh, cases or old code or legacy code, there might not be any updates. So, and in many cases, security fixes may be bundled together with other bigger release cycles. Uh, and it's, it's very hard to get that right trade-off and balance and comfort depending on you know, what, what you're trying to keep up with. Uh, the, that animation is about the various FFmpeg bugs and CVs that have come up in the past, I don't know, uh, many years or so. They've, they finally consolidated it into this one view. Uh, but I myself am uh, it's very, uh, I'm amazed at how many CVs get fixed every little every release. Um, and they're just CV numbers, then you can go and analyze if they apply to you, to you or not. So these are some other problems with running native binaries, right? You directly cannot just put something in production and then you're good. Like there's, there's a constant uh, amount of work and struggle that, that it'll take for you to, to keep up. And where does, uh, what layers does uh, exploitation really happen if there was a bug? Well, I, I tip, uh, from my uh, point of view, it's really either the application layer where there's an existing feature compiled in the binary that, is being, that could be misused or uh, uh, because of some flaw, some uh, lack of sanitized inputs, uh, that, that binary will then uh, execute that code and uh, the attacker might have the uh, 
might, might have the opportunity to escalate privileges towards unauthorized accesses on that system or other privilege escalation attacks and lateral movements. And it's way easier to craft application layer exploits once, in, once a flaw is identified, right? Or it occurs deep inside some routine where there's either lack of bounds checking or uh, you know, uh, uh, use after free bug or something of that sort is, is, uh, is realized based on some fuzzing effort. And it's hard to come up with those kind of exploits because uh, it, those exploits completely depend on the environment that that executable is uh, running in, state of the memory, <laughs> so forth. So your typical buffer overflow, uh, uh, you know, stacks and heap overflows uh, are, are the ones I'm talking about. So these these are the two major categories of exploitation that I see. And let's let's begin with an example, really, right? So how many of you have heard of image magic? A lot of you. I, I'm not surprised. Like it's it's one of the most commonly used batch processing utilities out there, and under the hood, it leverages multiple delegates or coders that are basically wrappers around other low-level libraries such as libjpg, turbo, libpng, and they these wrappers perform ultra-fast image conversions, compression, and decompression routines. They also wrap around other native executables to fulfill other subtasks, such as retrieving a URL from a remote host using wget. Uh, and a typical setup, this is how a typical setup would look like, right? You have an application server serving a, a web app to your users uh, with a front end that has a file upload functionality. Your image gets uploaded. and Asynchronously, from there on, it gets stored in your data data layer, and it gets uh, uh, moves on to processing. Um, and that black processing box right there is where you would typically have your image magic executable running on some server, and you get the processed image back, and it's presented back to the user in some shape or form, depending on the implementation. That's how a typical processing job would look like in in this context. And typical exploitation would be a crafted image with a payload inside it would be uploaded by the attacker. And that goes on to the application server. And that payload now sits on the server. If that image processing, uh, if, if, if there's lack of input sanitization, or if there's a command injection bug of sorts, then a lot of things can happen from there on. And that's what I meant by. It depends on what setup are you, are you uh, running your executable in. Uh, because from there on, you could either, the attacker could directly execute commands on the server, or they could attempt uh, network reachability to other hosts within your network segment, or they could try and connect out with a reverse shell to a command and control server. And that's your typical end-to-end -end, uh, how a breach would start or how a breach could occur, right? Fairly common uh, kind of uh, flow. And thus, this tool, that's how you know this, uh, got a lot of, lot of bad publicity. And there was a logo created with the tag image tragic. And there were f typical CVEs generated um, that mostly revolved around either uh, you know, ability to read and write arbitrary files uh, to do server-side request forgery, so you could have network reachability, uh, you know, via the utility itself. So just by virtue of you uploading a file, if you're being able to communicate with internal hosts or other sensitive hosts and get back some details out of it, or even with some interesting arbitrary protocol invocations like ephemeral, that uh, basically deletes the file after reading it, interpolating it on the image, and then, uh, you know. Uh, returning it back in the processed file. Or MSL, that basically converts an image file to any other extension anywhere on the file system. Uh, these are custom protocols, custom file, uh, files, uh, custom type of files that uh, ImageMagic supported. So listed mitigations on the image tragic website typically were, um, we recommend you to Start verifying the image files that you're receiving from your users. Uh, do some magic byte analysis and before sending them to ImageMagic. And 
you know, that was that was one of the one of them. And the other one was uh, Image Magic supports a policy file at an application layer to disable certain coders that may be bad for you for your environment. So ephemeral protocol could be disabled in that policy file, uh, and that would basically reduce the the kind of invocations you an attacker could make through that policy file. And they had some uh, FAQs listed, and, and some of them didn't really give me any confidence when I read these. I was like, uh, you know, are these mitigations effective? Uh, we cannot guarantee they will eliminate all vectors of attack. And are there any other ways to mitigate? Sandboxing is worth investigating, but we are not providing specific instructions. That was the FAQ. And this, there are scattered references all across um, you know, all across the net if you if you if you go look. So then there there was security guidance from industry veterans like Mihal Zelewski from Google on the bottom screenshot there uh, that posted on his blog some better mitigations than what image tragic FAQs were listing. And uh, that's more about hey, don't directly use image magic if you are just using it for transcoding and thumb thumbnailing purposes. Instead, directly invoke libjpeg turbo or giflib or any of those libraries, and you know you'll be in a better shape because they're uh, they're, they're more robust. And then he had advice on considering sandboxing the code with Seccom BPF, uh, and if all op other options fail, you know limit the set of image formats that are passed to this executable. And Again, I, uh, it's it's hard to imagine like uh, why we we only consider to uh, sandbox some things like for for something like this. In in my opinion, it's very 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 important to sandbox these kind of environments. So uh, that screenshot is from another uh, JPEG parser that basically somebody asked a question. There was no no issue with the parser, but somebody had asked the question on GitHub. Hey, what's is this production ready? And the developer was gave a very good advice, saying, "Hey, we are doing OSS fuzzing, and we are integrating with Google OSS fuzz. However, this is a JPEG file parser. It suggests high level of caution running it on untrusted inputs, and I recommend sandboxing." So it's very clear that we need to uh, anytime we are running untrusted code processing on untrusted inputs. It's very clear you have to do. Do it do so in a sandbox environment. But if we all know this and uh, we are aware of these kind of advices and mitigations available, you do a simple search, Google search, Hacker One, Image Magic. Hacker One, by the way, if you don't know, is bug bounty platform, both running public and private bug bounty uh, programs for companies and. These are the publicly disclosed ones, so you can just search them and learn from them. Um, there's so many results. I was amazed at 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 this at the state of being right. Uh, and most of the reported bugs are have some common themes, right? Network accessibility is one of them. Uh, where how does an attacker even try and try these exploits, right? They try to connect out or they try to use some other protocol like DNS to connect out, or they're trying to read some file, or they're trying to write some file. Um, so it just seemed to me like there's segregated advice all around, and there's no uh, no real approach that that's made available to secure such en environments in practice. If you're directly running in prod, uh, it's game over. It's just a matter of time and exploitation will, will occur. Um, and defense in depth is not a new concept, right? It's defense in depth, in my opinion, is just about limiting the blast radius that an attacker can have once they have some sort of code execution in your environment. Um, think about mobile phones. They are all third-party apps running on your devices uh, you know, under certain constraints, permissions, uh, and there's sort of a sandbox that's, that's preventing your phone from being <coughs> taken over from by those third-party apps, even even with apps that have malicious intent. So similar concept, uh, and, and uh, in theory, like defense in depth is 
is, is used in every successful device we use today. Um, and what are our security goals from, that, from this perspective, right? If you were to secure our execution environments. We want to prevent code execution. We want to prevent any sort of persistence that an attacker could have, if, even if they had some sort of code execution. And you want to prevent lateral movement. And how can you do so? Well, you need an unprivileged sandbox that restricts system calls per application. You need to disallow arbitrary reads and writes by jailing that environment. Need to have restricted, you need to assign restricted capabilities or Linux capabilities to privileged processes and drop all the other capabilities. You need to restrict any outbound network connectivity from that execution environment. And you need to make sure that the container runtime is to the absolute minimum to make it so-called ephemeral. So I, I consider this a three-step process. Let's say you are considering running some executable or already running. The way I look at it is step one, you need to profile that executable, right? You need to do some homework on that entire suite of tools. What's the security history? How much has this project been fuzzed? Uh, does it integrate with uh, actual fuzzers in, in their uh, open source uh, tooling? Um, how often is this project updated? How can you as a security professional subscribe to any, any security related events? Like just some basic homework on that. And then once you understand a little bit of history, that, that could give you some ideas, right? Like, these, hey, this project is always ridden with buffer overflow attacks. Uh, this project always has had one bug in the last 10 years, right? Gives you a sort of a, a, a land, attack landscape. And maybe it's just not been poked at completely, right? Uh, so, so you start poking at it, and you audit that program for dangerous functionality. By dangerous functionality, I mean any uh, code paths where that are either unnecessary or are highly privileged within that, within that tool set. You need to do system call profiling, uh, which is easily doable by using S-Trace. I'll show you that in, in, in a bit. And you need to threat model the application surface yourself, like understand the data flows, understand the inputs and outputs, understand the, the need to, for this program to read or write from arbitrary locations in your environment? Uh, does it need to reach out? Even if it needs to reach out, can you restrict that network reachability? Some very basic threat modeling. Um, and just spin up a VM or uh, a sandbox and profile that, uh, uh, that particular application. Run it, run all the, the possible functionality that you want to leverage in your actual production workflows. Uh, run some of those commands and see, see, see the network activity, see the file system activity. Just, just get a profile mapping. And seek the help of uh, documentation or other engineers in your company who may have already used that to, 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 uh, you know, as a proof of concept. And, and see, uh, turn on verbose logging, see all the logs that are generated by that tool. This is just basic profiling. And disarm the unnecessary functionality, as I said. Like, uh, this was the, the policy file for image magic where you could turn on or off uh, all those protocols, right? So with respect to system call profiling of the application, it's the art of gathering system calls available to the uh, used by the to be used by the executable. So install the latest application version in some sort of a sandbox container or a VM. If the project has some sort of test suites, launch them and uh, and run them in, in a scripted fashion and collect uh, and and don't forget. You have to do that with trusted inputs, right? Because again, you don't know what, what could happen. And that's why you're running it. You're limiting your testing to a, a sandbox container uh, or a VM. And execute the specific commands. Like for instance, image magic, there's two big utilities that I know of, convert and identify, right? Very commonly used. 
uh, even leveraged by other desktop, uh, Linux desktop, desktop distributions for a lot of, uh, lot, of need, lot of the needs. And then once you have that system call profile, you have a very good understanding of what, what is the minimum privilege required by this process when it runs. And you could then build a SecComp BPF profile. And SecComp, BF, SecComp BPF is a kernel security feature where a user land process can implement this filter and prevent or, uh, or actually uh, uh, allow certain system calls from executing when they're running. So that BPF, SecComp BPF profile will be built off of this syscall profiling. So, step two, harden the application layer. So, by that I mean two things, right? One is kind of the advice that was given in, in the image tragic facts and, and by uh, Michal was magic byte analysis. And the second is input validation. And I'll go through them one by one. Magic byte analysis is the art of parsing initial few bytes of a file and matching against a known set of file signatures. Right? So you're basically reading initial few bytes of a file that's incoming before you process it, and you compare those bytes to a known set of file signatures. And I, f I personally feel that's a recursive problem at best, because uh, Image magic itself provides a utility to do this kind of magic by analysis. So uh, you cannot just leverage the identify command and then do magic by analysis while you're trying to prevent from image magic exploitation. It's a recursive loop. So, um, and, and then what about polymorphic files where a file could be appended underneath another perfectly valid file? and you end up reading the magic bytes of only the, the first few bytes of that polymorphic file, and that would basically bypass your protections to, uh, you know, if you were using this to block processing in case, you know, you were only expecting a certain s set of, uh, you know, magic bytes to go through or file extensions to go through. So it's easier said than done. And there are bunch of utilities out there that again depend on image magic to do magic byte analysis. And file parsing in general, if not done right, can bring in a bunch of other issues. It's, it's a hard problem. There's so many file formats out there and so many ways in which that aspect can go wrong. So I myself actually used a third party uh, utility that is a wrapper around uh, the file, uh, uh, that is a wrapper around the library that the file utility invokes at, at runtime in Linux, right? So when you say file xyz.txt, it tells you, hey, this is a ASCII text, plain text file, right? So, and then input validation, the art of validating incoming data to block potentially malicious processing of unexpected content. Typically, traditional AppSec injection vulnerabilities like XSS have used this step as a defense in depth factor, right? In, instead of just context aware escaping on the output, you could do input validation as well and say, hey, this field, this form field on my application only requires uh, numbers. I only expect numbers to come in, and you know, if you if you encounter anything other than uh, zero to nine, then you're you basically don't allow that step to go forward. Uh, server side input validation typical, but it's hardly used in many contexts. It's because you your application may require freeform text, or uh, it just feels useless to many people. <laughs> so. It's an undervalued mitigation factor, in my opinion. And I can probably uh, uh, detect an attack in, in its tracks just by doing some sort of input validation on the incoming files, maybe. And third, harden your infrastructure. You have to have to leverage some sort of sandboxing. And you have to have an, an, a very secure network design 
for having such an environment where such critical code is executing. And it's all about practical reduction of attack surface. What will an attacker first do? Well, they will do arbitrary file reads and writes. They might do server-side request forgery attempts. They might reach, try and attempt to reach out using some protocol uh, towards the network. So if you can even take care of some of these with these defense in-depth steps, a large attack surface is already taken care of. So leverage sandboxing, right? There's so many container technologies out there, so many sandboxes out there, uh, and to each its own. So you have to decide what works best for you. But in general, run as an unprivileged user, run ephemeral containers, ephemeral, ephemeral runtimes. That means every process, processing job you, you, you execute has to get killed within an uh, uh, acceptable time limit. You're doing syscall filtering, so you're limiting the kernel attack surface by applying seccom BPF profiles. You're dropping any unnecessary capabilities and privileges that that process might otherwise have access to. And you're leveraging Linux namespaces you, uh, so that the process sees a very limited view of resources and, uh, and, and their PID trees and uh, all the other namespaces. And then you're giving it a jail for uh, some sort of a CH root where you specifically allow or disallow specific mount points for reading and writing from. So in terms of a secure network design, this is what I envision, right? Your production infrastructure, running the web application, um, doing everything else that's critical, Every, everything that, that you don't want to be mess, messed with, high trust network. Then you have an actual firewall that's separate from firewall on the, on the host itself that's blocking and that's literally uh, allowing or disallowing only specific ports. And then you have some sort of an executor proxy, sort of a man in the middle to say, hey, I have this job, apply this container config, run this job, and be done with it, and return the results in this data store. So you've isolated your execution environment, completely firewalled it off of your network, uh, your production network. And here you're doing all sorts of profiling in some sort of a sandbox container that's ephemeral. So all your syscall profiling needs to happen there, all your input validation routines. And if you choose to generate any alerts, from those input validation routines and magic byte analysis, or if you choose to block processing, and then the actual processing containers. So true ne network segregation is key. It will limit your limit what an attacker can do, even if they get code execution. While I don't say this often, but y you could think about using the cloud for setting up your processing infrastructure, just the processing aspects of it. If you, if if you have the leverage to do so. I'm not saying put all your data in the cloud. I'm just saying keep the execution bits in the cloud. And that completely separates and segregates your, your attack surface, which otherwise would be your production infrastructure. And, and there's so much new technology available. For instance, Intel has launched uh, uh, last uh, two years or so. It, it's, it's grown a lot. Uh, clear containers that have the CC runtime, uh, where each container is booted into its own lightweight virtual machine with its own unique kernel instance. So since each container will be running with its own VM, they no longer gain access to the host kernel, which is otherwise true uh, in terms of a container breakout for technologies like Docker, uh, where all the containers would be running on the same host kernel. So contain, it's, you're just one container breakout away to, to be uh, exploited on the host. So if you, if you could design in a way where you could run these sandboxes and VMs that have their own virtual machines, that have their own kernel spaces, that's the best, best way possible. But it's, it's easier said than done uh, in terms of uh, the trade-off. 
But at the very least, at least leverage to start with. You could leverage a lightweight process isolation tool. Google has, uh, or Google engineers wrote an N uh, utility called NSJL, which is a lightweight process isolation tool. It's not a full-blown uh, ecosystem in itself. It's simply giving all the security benefits that you would uh, that you would get out of like running a hardened container. So it allows the process to be to have no network connectivity. It allows the process to ha to be uh, ch rooted jailed to a particular uh, 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 to a particular directory that it's executing under. Uh, it allows you to specify custom seccomp profiles. Um, I think I think if you think of this entire uh, architecture, you have you you have full understanding of what you want to run. You you know the pro system call profile. You know the uh, any anomalous uploads that are coming in, so you can generate alerts and possibly feed it to your sim. And it's useful for incident triage in case something were to go wrong. You could actually go look back into those alerts. And then you, you have an execution environment through a strongly typed interface in a completely segregated, isolated network where you're running these jobs and then writing to some sort of a data store where you can retrieve the processed output. And that's pretty much the gist. Thanks for your time. <laughs> Questions? Uh, I think the link will be yes. posted Even to the, the slides. the recordings will be shared. Okay. Yeah. I have a quick question. I yes. came in late, so I might be totally out of this. But you're saying that you can take this uh, a piece of open source software that you're going to be dissecting, looking at the syscall by looking at S-Trace, and then whitelisting all that. And then eventually, you come up with a list of syscalls you want. Would this thing still work after you dissecting? Would that? software would ever even work after you whitelist? Absolutely. So the, the S-Trace utility is actually telling what that executable want, is wanting right. to use as a system call. Right. And you're basically taking that list of system calls out of the 300 plus system calls that are available. And you're, you're telling your uh, whatever sandbox that any, any other system call that an attacker might want to leverage is not allowed. And you're killing it. So basically, you really, really understand the third-party software in a way that you can just say, I don't want this syscalls. I only allow this. Is that what you're trying to do, is really yes. get her a, a deeper understanding? I also have another question. So do you do this with all most of your open source software at your company? You go through the same kind of process? I, I, I want to, I, I want to uh, make sure uh, I, I answer that correctly. <laughs> uh, I'm talking about native executables, right? So code that is usually uh, run, written in low-level languages. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. So uh, does that help answer? Yeah. And what was that fire? What NSJL. was? Okay. And okay, I'm not going to ask any more questions. I, I can meet you offline. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, no. How about you? Uh, you had a question. Uh, sure. Out. Uh, Thank you. I guess I can shout. <laughs> hey, uh, so uh, when you uh, profile that uh, image magic, I saw that there is a system call called execv. So if there is, if yes. You are so you you are right? you are definitely. Uh, that's basically a shell exec. Yes. So many. How, what can you do about it? That's where defense in depth comes in. That's yeah. where you. So isolate. that's a typical shell exec, right? Uh, yeah, it, every shell code would be doing executing an execv if it is an image if it's a memory corruption, right? Well, and it also depends on where you're running it. If you're namespacing things correctly, uh -huh. then you're limited to that namespace and that exec in uh, that namespace. It's, okay, got it, yeah. It's ju just not about like one one, one of the mitigation. Yes, so, yeah. yes, exactly. That's yeah. the whole gist of the yeah. talk is, mm. this is a defense in depth. Uh, yeah. So when you try, when, when you profile, I tried profiling Google Chrome with the, uh, the same tool and it didn't work. <laughs> Yeah, it didn't work, so that's what I... There, yeah. there's, there's a lot of help out there yeah. if you're trying to do so. Yeah, I, and I there wanted are to know your experience is doing that. Uh, no, so I have Profiling big applications to run with SecComp. I can't speak to that. Okay. <laughs> 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 Thanks. Okay. Thank I, you. Yeah, sure. Do we have any more questions? <laughs> All right.
right. Thank you so much, Mukul. Thank you. Yeah. Oops, sorry. I, I'm so sorry. You told me to. Oh, that's right. <laughs> it's okay. Yes. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Seriously, bro, good talk. <laughs> Thank you. You nervous? Uh, a little bit. Are you nervous yet? A little bit. You can tell, I just curious. I have to go to Alicia's back there. Yeah. She was back there. She oh, yeah. There. yeah. yeah. She, she's at three? She's up at three? Yeah. Oh, how did I say your name? Mukul. So, the same exact size. Okay, so sure, you yeah. were showing them why on the same side you were fire, fire parsing, right? So you did a file on this file, it shows you as a text file. There was another one that was shown, it's a PNG file, but you showed some, it's not really a, a, a picture file. What was that command that you were writing on? Oh, maybe. No, you didn't bother me. No, I'm just kind of like.